thank you very much for your attention for the next little while. Um, I'm very excited, as I told you the last time, that this is a word that's on my heart. Uh, so it's, it's entitled The Heart of God Part 2. <laughs> so I'm going to give us a quick summary just of um, what we talked about the last time. And when we were together the last time, we spoke about, uh, I was actually in the book of Leviticus, and uh, this is still where we're at. Nigel, I think you can go back to the next one as well, to the next slide, and everyone can see this. So we talked about the purpose of man, what, what we thought the purpose of man was, and um, the relationship and partnership with God uh, was one of the things that I think is probably the, the closest that I, I could come up as a wonderful definition for what why God made man. I think the reason for it is basically for relationship and for partnership. That's why, that's why I think we are here. Um, secondly, we were created in his image. That was something that we went through in, 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 in our time together last time, that we were created in the likeness and in the image of God. And we looked at the Hebrew of those, and it basically comes down to the resemblance. And when we look at the even more deeper definition of this resemblance or image and and uh, likeness, it went down to actually talking about authority, talking about actual representative authority. So being able to have the same stamps or the same authority as the person you have been sent by, to be able to act in accordance with that person, to be able to act in accordance as if you are, um, as if that person was there himself, right? So if someone is coming from the king's court, they are respected as if the king himself has been has come to visit and they are given the same kind of respect and honor, right? In the same sense, we understand that status and authority is what was given to us because as we looked in Genesis, when Adam and Eve were given a, a commission, I guess it's the first commission um, to man, which was to look after the Garden of Eden to tend to the to, to to look after the garden, look after everything, uh, have dominion, and all of that. We were given a certain kind of status, a certain kind of authority on this earthly realm. Right? We're not talking about authority that spreads uh, through all the realms as if we are God, because we are not God. We were just given a resemblance, a likeness, a stamp that allows us to function in a certain capacity on the realm that he has ordained us to. Secondly, we were given responsibility to take care, to take care of it, not just to be the ones who are the officiants and the ones who are ruling over it, but to actually take care of it. And then we moved on to actually understanding that we are to function as he does, function almost in the same way that God functions. So he is in control of the heavens, he makes man, and woman, and he puts them on earth, and he says, you know what, guys, I want to commune with you, I want to have a relationship with you, and then I want to do something else, I want to partner with you, but in a partnership, it's very simple. Anyone who's in business can tell you a partnership is not a real partnership if the one person who says we are partners is making all the decisions, right? That's not a partnership. So in, if in, in actuality, what God then does when he says, I want you to function like I do, I want you to partner with me, is that he places us here on earth and he says, we're going to be in relationship. I'm, I'm going to be the alpha CEO. I'm the main CEO. I'm the person you come to with any of your problems. But as you are on the earth, you make the decisions. You make the decisions. You look after everything. I just want a report back now and then. I want us to have regular board meetings every day if, if it's okay with you. And I want those board meetings to be as long as possible if that's okay with you. And then you can go and do whatever you want to do and enjoy the, enjoy the life that I've given you and enjoy the things I've, I've given you, right? So that's the plan. So you and I, let me not say you and I, let me say our first parents, Adam and Eve, they were placed here so that they could function like God, like their father, right? Function with him, but not forget one other thing, which was relationship. I, I, I put it to you in a central question or a central statement why the book of Leviticus was so important to me and my message to you last time and, and why what the heart of God could have been in, in, in conjunction with the purpose of why he made man. And I said to you, this is my central statement. No one else's. I just made this on up myself 
felt led to say, the story of the Bible is that of a holy God restoring holiness to his people who bear his image. Right? So for me, I summed up the reason why everything is how it is. This whole story of the Bible was for us to be able to recognize and to see that our God was, is holy and that this holy God who made us in his image, which meant that we possessed a certain kind of holiness, maybe whatever, whatever, however you want to quantify that in your mind, we possessed holiness as well because that's God cannot make something that is not of himself, right? Everything he made, he said it was good. So if he said it was good, that meant that man was good. If he is holy, that meant that man was holy. And that, at that, at that instance, what happens is in Genesis, of course we know sin enters the world and man is no more holy. So God who is holy cannot share the same space with his partners. And so they must be kicked out and their shares have to be sold back to God until such a time as they can buy back their shares. I want you to remember this part. Until such a time that we're going to use the business analogy, right? Until such a time as man could buy back their shares back into the company, back into the presence of God, right? They had sold them. They had given them up. They had, they had managed to find a way to actually just say, we're done, we're not actually going to do this like you want to do it, we want to do it our way. And God was like, no, there were certain kind of rules and boundaries and things I set in place. And to be fair, the only boundary that was set in place was just, don't eat the fruit from one tree. But there are so many others, and you couldn't even do that, right? So in that act, they sold their birthright, Right? So all that we see throughout the Bible is this holy God trying to restore holiness back to those who bear his image, who are meant to be and are supposed to be holy beings. Yeah? In Leviticus, Leviticus says it like this. Leviticus 11, 44 to 45 says, For I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore consecrate yourselves, and you shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves with any creeping thing that creeps on the earth. For I am the Lord who brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. And we talked a little bit about Leviticus. I talked to you about what, what, what we find in that book, uh, how things are quite essential for us to understand as a, as, as little sons and daughters of the king, our father God, for us to understand his heart for his children, we need to spend a lot more time, I think, in Leviticus. Not in a biased way. I'm not saying dump all of your reading and now go spend time in Leviticus. But what I am saying is when you do come to Leviticus in your reading or however your plans are, pray so circumspectly and humbly that you ask God to show you his heart as you read it. Because I said to you last time, I said, if you want to know about the heart of God and you want to know that from any book of the Bible, the best one is probably the one where God the Father himself speaks the most. And I said, every chapter in Leviticus, there are about 27 or 28 of them, every chapter in Leviticus begins with, and the Lord said to Moses. And it ends with, Moses or Aaron did what the Lord said. So every chapter in Leviticus is directly the speech from Father God himself. So if you want to know the heart of God, I suggested that we would sit and take some time in Leviticus. And now what I'm adding to that is when you are to think about Leviticus and you're thinking, man, but John, the book of John is so good, man. It just, he's, the, John has got the the poetry, he's got the, the way in which the rhythms go, it, it all just sounds good, the images are amazing, it's like a movie when I read it. Leviticus is just a list of things, I don't even know what it's about, I don't understand what it's for. What I'm saying to you is, take some time and pray for God to soften the heart, show you what he is about through that book. Because it is very interesting in our modern world now, when we think about this book, the book which is a very old book, one of the five of the Torah, right? It's right in the middle. There's Genesis, Exodus, 
Leviticus right in the middle, and you got Numbers, and you got Deuteronomy. Right? Those, this book of, of the law with which the Jews would hold on to, the, this book of instruction, this one in the middle takes the shortest time to happen. It takes about a month. It's recorded over, over that. that. That's the timeline that you read Leviticus in. It's a whole month that it takes place in. Whereas Genesis is about centuries, right? It starts from the beginning of time. You can't track Genesis because before the first event in Genesis, we don't even know what time was doing. That's how long ago and, and centuries old Genesis story and timeline goes. Then you get to Exodus, and Exodus is about a 300-year-old story, right? So this is the history of Israel of a massive nation. And then you get to Leviticus where it even zones down even more and it goes into a little tribe, the, the, this, this tribe that is supposed to now be the, the priesthood, the, the, the royal priesthood that is going to help this nation be able to come and commune and be with a holy God who has decided to place himself within a tent, a tabernacle, and they are to travel with him as his manifest presence. So this tribe is given all of that. You get into numbers, and then we span out a couple of years now. We have about 40 years of an experience within the book of Numbers. And you get into Deuteronomy, and Deuteronomy tells you the ages. It kind of foreshadows the ages ahead. So that's another centuries old. So this, this five book um, volume, this 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 a lovely collection of, of the law in these books does this outside to inside focus when it looks at Leviticus. And we want to look at it and go, okay, so why is it then it's an important piece of what we have to digest as a modern Christian society? And I, I, I put it to you this way. So Leviticus, in its actual function, most of it has got nothing to do with you now. If you read it, you can have wonderful debates with people on the street as to why you don't, you're supposed, you're eating pork, but you're not supposed to eat pork. You're eating this and you're not supposed to eat that. That's what Leviticus is. You can have very entertaining discussions about that. If you choose to stop there, if you choose to just go, okay, this was the book, I, sh I either follow the Bible to the letter or I don't. And that's a healthy debate for you to want to consider too. But I, I, I would suggest that we need to understand that that's not the place that we're at. We don't take the Bible. We take the Bible literally, of course, but within the right context of each and every event and in time that it takes place. But we do not have to apply every single thing to our daily living. Does that make sense? Because, to, to be honest with you, a lot of Leviticus does not a, a, a apply to you anymore. But that is because the book of this particular law was fulfilled through Jesus Christ. I want to read a quote um, to you. Now, you don't have to get to it. We'll... We'll get to it later on, but, but it feels like just as I've been flowing, I'm ahead of myself already, so I'm just going to read it to you. You'll see it in the slides as we get there later on. So Zach McIntosh uh, writes this, and uh, it's a very beautiful description of the book of Leviticus. And before I read it, I want you to know that the reason why there are so many of these things that don't really apply to us was because in Leviticus, these laws were categorized into three different things. There was a civic law, the ceremonial law, and then there was moral law. Now, as we know, moral law is what you and I see as a common thread all the way throughout the Bible. All the way before even the law was instituted, moral law was placed in your and I's conscience. So when Cain and Abel, when Cain and Abel are brothers and Cain decides to off his brother, that's moral law already being taken place because he has judgment that is passed on him. He is not supposed to murder. It's as simple as that. Murder is part of those <clears throat> moral things that we know. <clears throat> Excuse me. Frog in the throat. Okay, I think we're going to be okay. Let's keep going. So moral law is a very important thing that we, we cannot 
argue about. We are in a world that will argue about it because, of course, it is not something that everyone is happy about. The moral law is like any rule. And anyone who finds any umbrage with any kind of issue is going to want to have it their way. That's our flesh. That's our way of being fallen and removed away from this holy God. And then there was this civil law. And civil law talked about how you and I were going to do business together, how you and I were going to live in a society together. And then there was ceremonial law, and ceremonial law had a lot to do with how you were going to be restored or you were going to come and pay your, um, your, your, your penance to the king of kings, to, to God himself. So the ceremonial law had to do with you actually shedding blood for the sins and the wrongdoing that you did. And there were different laws. I said to you the last time, I think it was about 600 and. 13, let me find the figure for you. There were so, there's so many of them in the book of Leviticus. Excuse me. There are so many in the, in the Old Testament, about 613 laws and 251 are found in the book of Leviticus. Right? So you can see this whole tribe that is in, that is responsible for all of this, this, this priesthood that is responsible for coming and making this be the actual ordinances of God, and this must be how this whole nation lives. The whole nation of Israel is supposed to now live in this way. They're supposed to digest this, and this is what they must do day in, day out. Ceremonial law was part of their life. It's part of their worship. It was part of what they had to do to come before the king. And even they themselves weren't the ones who came before the king. The high priest was. So as we go on, I want to read, I want us to read together. You, we read this last time when we were together, is the Day of Atonement. We're going to start reading from here together. And so this is chapter 16. But I want you to understand that these things were all fulfilled in Christ. Yeah, they were all fulfilled in Christ. And this quote, which is so beautiful, says it, it reads this way. We read every law through the lens of what Christ taught, what he has done, and what he fulfilled. <clears throat> he took the capital punishment of the civil law that all of us as sinners deserve when we die on the cross. So anything and everything that went wrong between you and someone, your neighbor, your ox bashed into a neighbor and killed him or injured him, all of the stuff that happened, just civil law, Jesus went and took the punishment for that. He put an end to the sacrificial law by being the better sacrifice. Sacrificial law, meaning that you and I had to make sure our goats were ready, uh, all of our offerings were ready so that we could go ahead and have these given to the high priest and the high priest would then go ahead and spill blood so that our sins would be forgiven. Jesus was the better sacrifice and we'll talk a bit about that today. And he lived a perfectly moral life in our stead so that we could be declared righteous in God's sight. To understand the Old Testament law, we must understand it through Christ Jesus. This is what we are in, in, in our conversation today are looking at today. Everything that is important for you and I to experience when we read the Old Testament is to frame your thinking and understand that in that time, these folks had to do so much just to come into the presence of God or just to be in right standing with God. And what we're about to read now, which was the Day of Atonement, was where everything came to it. Every year, there was one day where all of this would come and would be atoned for. Your sins would be atoned for. And you and I don't have to do any of that. When I read through Leviticus, and I was getting so bored, I'll be honest with you, man. <clears throat> like the first chapter is the burnt offerings. And then, like, it goes on. Like, okay, it's the burnt offerings. 
In the burnt offerings, okay, then there's grain offerings. What? Then there's peace <laughs> offerings. Then there's this offering and that offering. And there's just offering after offering after offering after offering. And I thought, man, if, if I was like, yeah, of course I'd, I'd be okay with it because it's part of my life and my society and my everything. And this is what I'm born into and this is what I know and this is what I must do. But I'm sure there'd be a part of me somewhere, or at least I can say this because I'm not born in that time. I'm born in this one under the free grace that has been extended to me by Jesus Christ. I have the luxury of looking back and going, that is a lot of work that thankfully you and I had nothing to do with our being able to stand in front of, Jesus, uh, in front of God. We had none of that that we needed to do. So let's read together. And uh, I want to encourage you. This is the best encouragement I'll give you. Please go and read Leviticus. Because I want you to feel the weight of boredom that I felt. <laughs> no, but in all seriousness, I want, you to, I want you to read it. And I want you to read it going, this is a lot. I want you to read it and realize what you were saved from. But that what we take for granted so much. Like if you were poor in that time, you put together whatever money you could find just to buy. God made provision for the poorest. If you didn't have a dove or you couldn't buy a pigeon or something, whatever bird it was that was bottom of the list, God was like, okay, you can bring bread. That could be your offering. But the point I'm trying to make is that the poor, those who had nothing, did not have an excuse for not bringing something. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? They had to bring something. At that stage, Father God is holy. If, if you want to be with me, then you're going to have to bring something. You have to bring something. That is another thing I want you to note down there. You have to bring something. It's not going to be a dove or a loaf of bread or anything like that. It's not going to be a pigeon. But in the new dispensation, in, in, in what Christ has, has made affordable to us and, and, and available to us, the principles still apply which is what we, we miss when we read Leviticus or Numbers or anything like that. We miss it. We think, because it doesn't apply to me, there aren't any principles that apply to me. And that's not true. There are still principles that apply to us when we read books like Leviticus, because there is a kind of attitude that is present in what the Father wants his children to exhibit. There is a kind of response that is talked about from the first word to the last in that whole book that is about the attitude that the Father expects His children to have when they come to worship. Now, it is not legalistic anymore. It is not about um, doing the right stuff. It is not necessarily about this is what you do and this is regimented and, and these are the, the ceremonial acts that you do. It is not that. Of course it's not that. And thank you that it's not that, Lord Jesus. But there is something in the dedication, in the desire, and in the fact that they know that their God expects something. Tonight was so beautiful in these words that, was, that were shared um, by the Spirit because the point about this banquet that Heather was, was, was speaking so beautifully about and praying over us, God expects you there. He expects you there. But many of us in our life experience of sometimes of our Christianity, we kind of think that God, because he has given his son on the cross, that there isn't anything else that I need to actually then do. And that couldn't be further from the truth. There is still so much that God wants you to do. What is great about what he wants you to do is that it's all to do with an abundance 
of life. It's all to do with restoring you to this place of authority again. It's all to do with getting you back to the place where you are at the head and not the tail with him. That you are a conqueror through him. That you are able to speak life into others because of him. That you are able to see your life and navigate the challenges that come because of him. But many a times we miss what is on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the table for us. We miss what's in front of us. Because we don't understand that these chapters or this story, this very seemingly difficult, and I'm, I will give Leviticus props here. Apparently it is not the least read book in the Bible. <laughs> Another book, Obadiah, has taken that crown. Apparently, Obadiah is the least read book in Christian circles. So I must give Leviticus props. Leviticus is actually being read by Christians and by us, which is really good. I think how we read it is different. I think we can improve on that quite a bit. All right, let's read. Let's read. This is from the um, ESV. So... We're going to read. And as we read, I'm just going to unpack scripture with us. I I don't plan to keep us here for a very long time. But I really want you to get the heart behind what God's heart is for his people. Which is why when you get out of here on, on, on this Sunday evening and you go to work tomorrow and you see your colleague and you go, Man, my Holy Father wants you to return back to holiness too. My Holy Father wants you to become what he has wanted you to be. My Holy Father wants you to be released from whatever bondage you, you, you are struggling with or trapped in. That you can have the same heart that the Father has. Because this whole story through Jesus Christ is about you and I being able to return to holiness. It is the only reason why we'll be able to be in the same room and presence of God. You cannot come to God without having, without being holy. Now, before I I read, I'm sorry, I have to unpack all of this. Now, there are different stages of sanctification, right? We have been sanctified, we are being sanctified, and we will be sanctified. We have been Jesus dying on the cross. Being our actual steady walk with Jesus, choosing him, choosing to live a pure life, will be when he comes again. Does that make sense? So yeah, so I'm not saying that as you sit here, you and I have reached holiness. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, because Jesus is in your heart, and Jesus is in your life, you do possess a holiness that allows you to come before the Father. Straight through. No veils, no nothing. Comes before the Father. And that you definitely need because God is not going to sit with anyone who does not have that in his presence. He's not going to, a holy God is not going to be like, yes, I'm going to sit love, ha- happily with you in my presence. I'm not talking about, hear me very clearly because I can see how it might be understood. I'm not talking about you and I, not being at a place where, where we struggle with things, we are sinners, sinners on the street. I'm not talking about that. Of course, God has made grace and has made mercy available. He's made all of that available for us to come before him and sit at his feet. And that's the point. What I'm talking about is that there was a price that had to be paid for you and I to be able to be in the presence of God. Do you understand me? Does that make sense? All right. Let's read. Let's read. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's a very good long preamble. Let's read. First, uh, chapter 16, verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they drew near before the Lord and died. And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, your brother, not to come at any time into the holy place inside the veil, before the mercy seat that is on the ark, so that he may not die. For I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. But in this way, Aaron shall come into the holy place with a bull, from the herd for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen coat and shall have the linen undergarment on his body. And he shall tie the linen sash around his waist and wear the linen turban. These are the holy garments. He shall bathe his body in water and then put them on. 
and he shall take from the congregation of the people of Israel two male goats for a sin offering and a ram and one ram for a burnt offering. Now I want to I want to pause here and say to you that Aaron is of the family that is going to be the high priest. His sons will be part of this lineage for the history of Israel, right? His two sons, Nadab and Abihu, are their names. I don't know if I pronounced them correctly. You can be the judge, but they are the names. Nadab and Abihu are the two sons who died here. Because they came before the Lord, and there are different accounts, or not different accounts, but there's um, different ev evidence and commentary on they were probably drunk when they came. Um, they, they definitely came before the Lord when it was not a time for them to come in and sacrifice things. So there was a def de definite disrespect for the sanctuary of God, the, the sanctity of it and the holiness of God. There was an absolute disrespect. Whatever the condition was, the point was, the point is, is that in the way that they approached God and they came to God, it was absolutely disrespectful. And it was, there was no way that God was going to um, approve of that or even try and protect them from it. Which is an example of what I want you to think about now in how you and I even come before the Lord. I'm not trying to say to you that you must come before the Lord as um, some sort of religious guru. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that our hearts matter. God sees what's in your heart. So long before you are trying to mask whatever is in your heart, just be honest with God, be truthful with the King, and come before Him in your humility and humbleness. Because this God is not a God who plays around. He kills people in the presence of his holiness. Do you understand me? So these two sons are dead, right? And Aaron is told, this is how you're going to approach me. Now the list that God gives him of how he's going to approach him is absolutely in line with what we're talking about here in terms of humility. If you remember in Exodus 28, the list that was laid out for how a high priest would be dressed up, it was incredible. He was beautifully arrayed. Nigel, if you can just actually skip down there's, um, I think it's maybe slide number 10. There's a, a slide there that's got a picture of what the high priest were, were, was arrayed in. So this was the full regalia. This was the full, full regalia for what a high priest would be wearing, right? So this is the, an example of the two. This is what God is saying Aaron must be dressed as when he comes before him. I want you to see the beauty of, the beauty of this. God says, I want you to come before me humbly. I don't want you to come in the pomp and the circumstance in all of the glory that I've set before you. I don't want you to come dressed up in how you, you appear to the people. This is how any high priest was to be represented to the people. This was how Aaron, when Aaron was in front of the Israelites representing God, that's how he was meant to be dressed. But when he, be, when he came before the king, when he came before God, and he was going to be representing the people, this is how he was meant to be dressed. So even in this special day, this, this very important day, because all of these people, this nation of Israel, right, this one person is coming before the king to atone for their sins. This one person, that's his responsibility right now. He must make sure that everything is stripped away. Is this sounding familiar to you? There's a story about an ultimate king, an ultimate high priest who died on a cross and there was a lot that was stripped from him. Even down to the flesh. Stripped. Everything in this high priest that was part of this. God's glory. This is God's glory before the people. You must see me this is God saying, me, as your God and king, that is how you see me. When you see the high priest in his full regalia, you understand that the glory of God is here. It is, it is, it is tabernacling with you. I am here to commune with you. I am in your camp. I am in your midst. So this is how you know I am bringing this word. But when you come with whatever you have, with your, your heart, with your life, with your situations, this is how you come before me. 
because I can see through all of this. Many a times we have all of our stuff still on. And God says, I see through all of that because firstly, if you are actually honest with your life, everything you have, God has given you. Everything these guys had, these high priests, the, the arrogance that uh, Nadab and Abihu had to actually think that they could get into the presence of God, they were, they were smitten because God is saying, you don't get it. This is not you. You didn't do this. You didn't come up with a plan that makes you, that makes you stand in, 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 in my presence. You didn't come up with a plan. You didn't come up with the right things that make you okay with me. That was not man's doing. Everything we have is God's doing. And in this depiction of what the high priest looks like, we get to see everything that God is saying very clearly, just in the attire, I am responsible for everything. So how you come to me is not about what you have or what you've done. It is about you and you alone. Yeah? Let's go back, Nige, to that, to that slide. So all of this is, is put on him, and he says, okay, now you've got to have a bowl for you. What's beautiful about this is that Aaron himself had to make atonement for himself first. Before he could go anywhere closer to the king, before he could get into the Holy of Holies, he had to make sure that his own sins, his own family, everything that was about him, that was atoned for first. Atonement is a, a, a modern uh, meaning, I guess, which is to you know be at one with something. Atonement, at one mint to be at one with something. But more, more traditional or older definitions of, of the word would come to a point where you, you can see them as compensation. It means compensate, to, to be compensated for. Remember I said to you that there was a business transaction that happened and that the cost for Adam and Eve to pay was way too high? Whatever you and I pay or give God, it's not going to be enough for what we gave up. It's never going to be enough. That's where this idea of compensation came from. This holy God who says, I am God, I made you in my image. You are holy. This is how you are going to make it right with me. You need to have these sacrifices. This, the offerings that existed in that time are as follows. There were burnt offerings, meal offerings, peace offerings, sin offerings, and trespass offerings. The first three, burnt, meal, and peace offerings, those three were seen as your gratitude offerings. Those were the ones that you would, you would, you would give or you would do to give thanks, to say, Lord, thank you. Right? Thank you. Something would be exchanged to be, to be eaten as well. Thank you for this. Thank you for that. The second two, sin, uh, sin offerings and trespass offerings, those were your guilt offerings. There was a certain amount of guilt that you and I amass when we live as sinful beings. And even more so, in that space, those guilt offerings, they were actually finished, they were only made right by some sort of animal sacrifice. Let's go back to our, our reading. We're going to read now from verse 6. Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. Then he shall take the two goats and set them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Aaron shall cast lots over the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for Azazel. This is um, a Hebrew word, a name, actually. There's, there's commentary on this being that the name Azazel was for a demon that was, it was believed in those times that in the wilderness, this demon, there were these demons in the wilderness that lived. You know, it was, the wilderness was a bad place to be. You didn't go out into the wilderness to go and find an oasis. You just didn't. That's not how it worked. You stayed where, where things were, were fruitful in your home country or the country or the land that was actually giving. You didn't go out into the wilderness, right? So Azazel is this name of, of, 
of a demon. But in translations as well, we find the name scapegoat. Um, part of the commentaries, it's not important for us right now to think of these goats, or this goat being atoned for, that, that the Lord was atoning to a demon. That's not what this is talking about. What it's talking about is mostly the fact that what was happening at the time was that all of whatever was going to be sacrificed, this scapegoat, this goat that was going to be given also for the, uh, the sins of the people, it was to be sent out into the wilderness as far as it could go. And there was no telling where it was going to go, no telling what was going to happen to it, or what it was not appeasing the quote-unquote demon. But Azza, the, the, the word, the first A-Z, is, um, is the word goat. Azel, Azazel, is the word go away. So basically the name came as a go away goat. This is what this Azazel is. But also there was also links to this demon because that's part of what the life um, philosophies or thinkings and beliefs were in that time. So that's where we get our scapegoat terminology from because as a, as a translation is it's a go away goat. But the idea behind this go away goat is so that you know that what was going to happen to the sins or the iniquities of these people, once a year, this goat would be sent far away. It reminds us of the scripture of how God says he'll remove our sins as far as the east is from the west. Yeah, so that was this shepherding or this ushering of this goat. Let's read verse 9. And Aaron shall represent the goat on which the lot fell for the Lord, and use it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell for Azazel shall be presented alive, and the Lord to make atonement over it, and it may be sent away into the wilderness to Azazel. So this goat will be sent out. All right? Let's keep reading. Verse 11. Aaron shall present the bull as a sin offering for himself, and sh am I reading the same thing? No. And shall make atonement for himself for and for his house. He shall kill the bull as a sin offering for himself. And he shall take a censer full of coals of fire from the altar before the Lord and two handfuls of sweet incense beaten small. And he shall bring it inside the veil and put the incense on the fire before the Lord. That the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is over the testimony so that he does not die. And he shall take some of the blood of the blood and sprinkle it with his finger on the front of the mercy seat on the east side. And in front of the mercy seat he shall sprinkle the blood of he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. Let's keep going. Verse 15. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people. I just want you to listen to all the language, okay? This is what one person must do on this whole day, all right? As you are sitting here being like, man, this is a lot of scripture of just what this guy is doing, I want you to think of how you would have to do the same thing if you were high priest, okay? Then he must kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring its blood inside the veil and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the goat, sprinkling it over the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. Thus he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the people of Israel and because of their transgressions, all of their sins. And so he shall do for the tent of meeting, which dwells with them in the midst of their uncleanness. No one may be in the tent of meeting from the time he enters to make atonement in the holy place until he comes out of them out and has made atonement for himself and his house and for all the assembly of Israel. Then he shall go out of the out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it. And he shall take some blood of the bull and some of the, and some of the blood of the goat and put it on the horns of the altar all around. And he shall sprinkle some of the blood on, on it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and consecrate it from the uncleanness of the people of Israel. This is only verse 19. I think there are like 10 more verses. This guy has done a whole day's worth of work. Do you understand how much work it is to, to like slaughter an animal? He's, he, must, he's, he's, he must slaughter a bull, and then there's a goat he must slaughter. All of that requires work. Work. Okay? One thing I want to just pause here as we've, as we've stopped at verse 19. 
is that this book of Leviticus also introduces something that is very important for us to understand. It's the idea of things that are holy and things that are common, how those are in opposition, things that are clean and things that are unclean. Throughout the entire Old Testament, that's the story that we read. We read how they're supposed to eat this, they're not supposed to eat that. When they've done, they've, they've done this, they should do that to cleanse themselves. They have to wash so many times. They have to do all of this idea of clean and unclean, um, common and, and, and holy. These things are things that God needed to stipulate because ultimately they have a certain kind of bearing on his heart. Holiness is important to God as well as purity. Now, is holiness and purity, are they the same thing? No, they're not. Can you be holy and not pure? Yes. Because you can say yes to Jesus. You've already gotten holiness because of Jesus' holiness that's in you. But you, you can also not be pure because of the decisions you make day to day. Does that make sense? Now, this is the, the, the minutia of detail that God had to go through because that is what's required if you want to be in his presence. So they had to make sure that they were atoning for all of that. What could get them into a right place of holiness and what could get them into a right place of purity, of cleanliness. Okay? It's important for us to see this. Let's keep going. And when he has made an end of atoning for the holy place and the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall present the live goat. The holy place, even the tabernacle, God was like, even this, Aaron, you are going to atone for it. You're going to have to make atonement for it because it is in the camp with the people who are also unclean. So the actual tent, the actual tabernacle, the actual thing, God was like, down to this thing that I live in, you will make atonement for it. Because the, the mere fact that there is sin that exists in the, in the camp is enough for us to be at odds. So where you are going to be making the, the atonement, where you are going to be making the actual sacrifices, the actual um, 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 pleading of people to be cleansed, that too must be, must be cleansed. Okay? Verse 21. And Aaron shall lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it the iniquities of the people of Israel and all their transgressions, all their sins. And he shall put them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness. The goat shall bear all the iniquities on itself to a remote area, and he shall let the goat free in the wilderness. This is what I talked about a little bit earlier, to say that there is something very beautiful about what happens here. You can see a whole lot of similarities of the importance of what is what Jesus has done on the cross already just in these few verses. I want to point out to you the idea of this goat and this portion of it. Everyone in Israel was meant to see this. This was a public portion, right? The laying on of both hands, the sin, all of it being laid on on this goat. The poor goat is... Is, is, an, is a willing partner, uh, party in, in this transaction. It, has, it bears no sin, but it is a willing partner, participant. You must remember that as well. This is an animal that is not, it has not accrued any kind of sin in its life. It is an animal that is now the representation of what everyone in Israel is going to lay on. This was laid on the head of the goat, both hands laid on the head on the goat. This goat then is seen, everyone must see how this goat is led out from the city, out of the city walls, into the wilderness. In the same way that Jesus was crucified outside of the city. Right. So when we talk about why we read these, these books in the Old Testament, we read them through the lens of Christ because there's a fulfillment of the law that has been done all the way through. 
It is for you to go and make sure you study those and you see them and you get enriched by how Christ has fulfilled the law to the T. All of the iniquities of the people of Israel laid on this cloth, on this animal, and it is led out into the wilderness. It is led out into the wilderness by a suitable man. Beautiful piece of scripture. This is a, a, a willing man, a, a man who was also of the community. He would go uh, to a certain, um, uh, what is it, distance. And after that, the goat was free to roam. And he would come back. He himself had instructions to when he returned, he would have to wash himself clean. Let me finish up with this reading. We've got two more slides to read. Let's go from um, verse 23. Then Aaron shall come into the tent of meeting and shall take off the linen garments that he put on when he went into the holy place and he shall leave them there. He shall bathe his body in water in a holy place and put on his garments and put and come out and offer his burnt offering and the offerings of the people and make atonement for himself and for the people. And the fat of the sin offering he shall burn on the altar. And he who lets the goat go to Azazel shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water, and afterward he may come into the camp. And the bull of the and the bull for the sin offering, and the goat for the sin offering, whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place, shall be carried outside the camp. Their skin and their flesh and their dung shall be burnt up with fire. And he who burns them shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water. And afterward, he may come into the camp. Last slide. Thank you for your resilience. And it shall be a statute for you forever that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, so roughly around September, October, you shall afflict yourselves. You shall do no work, either the native or the stranger who sojourns among you. For on this day shall atonement be made for you to cleanse you. You shall be clean before the Lord for all your sins. It is a Sabbath of solemn rest to you, and you shall afflict yourselves. Basically, you shall deny yourselves, right? It is a statue forever. And the priest who is anointed and consecrated as a priest in his father's place shall make atonement, wearing the holy linen garments. He shall make atonement for the holy sanctuary, and he shall make atonement for the tent of meeting and the altar, and he shall make atonement for the priests and for all the people of the assembly. And this shall be a statute forever to you, that atonement may be made for the people of Israel once a year, once in a year because of their sins. And Aaron did as the Lord commanded Moses. This was to happen once a year. On this once a year, these folks would have their sins forgiven. You and I live under a different grace. Hebrews 7, 26 to 28 says, Nigel, you can go to this one. Um, it's after that. For it is indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, First for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weaknesses as high priests, but the word of the oath which came later than the law appoints a son who is to be made perfect forever. Jesus, as we know, is our ultimate high priest. Christ fulfills all things sacrificial, all things ceremonial and all things civil. In Christ, the atonement of sins extends, goes beyond, and is a finished work. What remains for you and me, who possess this um, gift of life eternal, what remains for you and me, who have this ability now to come close to the Father whenever we want to, whenever you want to, what remains for you and me is what I said right at the beginning. Our heart response. We, through reading this book, can learn a little bit about the heart of God. My question to you is, okay, what do you think God God wants our hearts to be toward him. 
Because you can spend a whole lot of time studying scripture, looking through scripture, understanding who God is and what the fa- who, who he is as a father. It is all good and well. But at the end of the day, this part of the story of the Bible, this part of the story for me, when I read through Leviticus and I see everything that has to be done, I'm left with a few things. One of those things is that there is a response that God requires from you and I. After we are called sons and daughters, there is a response that is not passive, an active response. We are borderline, majority of us in how we engage with Christianity is somewhat reserved. And when I say reserved, I mean that with respect. When I say even conservative, I mean that with respect. Some of us are very happy to have the badge of Christendom and cross over into the next life. And God says, okay, cool, that's that's fine. Look, I'm happy for that. But there is something that also burns in the heart of the Father, I believe, that goes beyond just the rescue effort that he's been able to put in place. Remember, before Adam and Eve would do what they did, God knew that he'd have a plan to sort it out. So this didn't just happen. When they eat from the apple, it doesn't just go, oh my goodness, now they're gone, they're lost, my children, I'm never going to see them again. He goes, okay, cool, they did make that decision. This is what I'm going to then put in place. Now, here's the rescue effort. Then the rescue effort happens. But then, in Matthew 28, if you have your Bibles with me, very well-known portion of Scripture. It's not up on the slides. You all know it very well. It's right at the end. I mean, you can read it for yourself. I'm not even going to read it for you. But I'm just going to read the title of, of the pericope, which is The Great Commission. So, at that stage, Jesus comes and he fulfills everything, right? So two years, 2,000 years ago, the great rescue mission was fulfilled. It was done. Cool. It's set in place. Now anyone who calls on me, on me, believes in their heart, and confesses with their mouth, that person is saved. That's it. But then Jesus says, okay, this is my father who has sent me. He has given me a second part of my rescue mission which is you and I are now restored in, when we go back to the first slide, we're restored in our relationship and partnership. The Great Commission comes and it says this, we are now partners again. Now as partners, I want you to go back to Genesis and do exactly what my dad told you to do. What did he say for us to do in Genesis? Genesis 1, when he, when he made man and he looked at the world and everything was good, what did he say to us? Well, to our first parents, Adam and Eve, what did he say? Be fruitful, multiply, have, have dominion over? Right, 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 right. Everybody's awake. Yeah, they're awake. All right, so he says, okay, be fruitful, multiply, have dominion. What did Jesus come and do in, in 28, in Matthew 28? The same thing. Different words, but it's the same heart of the Father. Which means then that after he came and he made sure that you and I were back in right relationship, were back in partnership with him, Jesus comes and he says, my Father's will is the same as mine and I want to make it yours. So if you want to know what God's response for you or God's expectation for you is, more than just becoming right with him it's a it's a two part deal remember it's a two part deal i didn't say to you that god was restoring holiness just because he wants relationship i said god is restoring holiness because he wants partnership as well as relationship so the two go together we sometimes treat relationship as the most important thing and we forget the partnership I'm not saying that relationship isn't important. 
Because we also, in this church, I'm very proud to say that in this church, we make it a point to make sure that we understand that God desires relationship more than he desires the flashy things that you have done. What we're getting to here is we want to make sure that the heartbeat that, that is for God is the same as what it is in Scripture. And that heartbeat is this. I want you to go and I want you to spread the gospel. I want you to make sure that everyone knows what it is. I want you to go ahead and I want you to take it back. I want the same thing that you have experienced for others to experience too. I want you to make sure that all of this happens. And lo and behold, listen, I'm going to help you this time because the last time I left you alone and you actually messed everything up. But this time I'm going to be with you till the end. Do you understand what's going on here? So Jesus says, the heart of the Father is, well, you and I are still partnering together. I still want your partnership. I still want your relationship. And I'm going to even do more this time around. I'm going to step in with you, which means I'm going to be in you. I'm going to be with you every day. When you're in that office with those people who are just, love those swear words coming so nice and easy, it's almost like it's English when they live and breathe it, or when you are with people who are, who are so happy to just live that life that you're like, man, that is so dangerous. And they don't understand you and they don't really appreciate you and they look at your lifestyle or they look at who you believe in and what you believe in and they go, that is so outdated. You are so square. You don't even have any room for fun. You are gray. All I see is gray. As a human being, you are gray. Look at my life. It is so colorful. I go party. I go do this. I go do that. I do all of these things. And Jesus says, it is in this situation that you and I are here, sent from the Father. This is the situation that we were sent for. Because that person was you. That person was you. Now, you are coveting relationship with me so much that you're you're forgetting the deal, we, not the deal. I don't want to say it like that because then it sounds like you're in this for a transaction. And that's not the truth. God didn't make this happen for it to be transactional. But God did make it, want to make it very clear that there is something that he does expect from us. If that wasn't the case, Matthew 28 would not have been there either. When Jesus says, when it's, when it's written, Great Commission, it is very specific in the wording. Co-mission. Co-together. Mission. To mission together. That's literally what that last, those last three verses are when you read them. You and I, are, whether we like it or not, this is part of what we've got to reconcile. People out there think they have to be a certain way before they come to God. But you and I have sat, sat through an hour plus because Sifiso can't keep quiet. He's just rambled on for about an hour telling you about how Leviticus was such an incredible book of such an immense detail of God's desire for his people to actually be able to come and be with him. James goes even further and says, this is what the father says. Draw near to me and I will draw near to you. That was not the speech of Leviticus. That was not the speech of the Old Testament from the king. But God himself understands that because of what he sent his son to do, and his son did such a great job doing it, you and I are in a space where we can actually experience what it means to have relationship and draw near. But I'm wanting to awaken our hearts and our spirits and our conscience that a relationship is as important because it must produce a desire to see others reconciled with Christ. And if it does not produce a desire to see others reconciled with Christ, you and I are missing out on adventures with with Jesus that we, we, 
I don't know. We're neither better off or, or worse off, but we're just missing out. Because we know when Jesus said that the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but I have come that you may have life and life in abundance, all of that was for the purposes of his kingdom coming on earth. But we have made life and life in abundance become something that means material blessing. We have made that scripture be life and life in abundance mean about how our comfort and how, how, how good our life will be. Everything that came out of Christ's mouth was for the purpose of the heart of God, was for the purpose of the mission of God, which was to restore holiness to his people. So that scripture, when you think about John 10.10 10 again, you've got to think about it in that light and go, no, it's not about just me having all of the things I need. Jesus addressed that in Matthew 6. Don't worry about what you need. So John 10.10 10 then isn't about the things that I worry about that I need. It is about me having life in abundance for the purpose of reconciling and seeing the kingdom of heaven come here on earth. Where it says to seek first the kingdom and its, and its righteousness and all these things will be added to you. So that is the heart of God. That is the heart of Christ. That is the response he wants us to have when we follow him. Again, when Christ says, follow me and I'll make you fishes of men, he didn't say, follow me and I'll have a wonderful relationship with you. Now, he didn't also negate that, right? He didn't negate the relationship part. But he did say, missionally, you and I are following, you are following me, because I want you to go out there and do something. My heart for you secretly is to turn you all into evangelists. And that's the honest truth. I was turned, I was turned into an evangelist. I'm, 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 I don't mean it as it's, it's my gifting. I mean it in the sense that I, I am actively working to have an external focus beyond myself for those who don't know and are not reconciled to Christ. My heart for you and us looking at this two-part series that I, I was so excited to share with you, my heart is about you hearing what God's plan is. In the modern world right now, we sit under a lot of, 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 of messaging that is about being in a wonderfully successful life experience. And that is a material outlook. So it is very, very fair that us as Christians struggle with an opposite messaging. We struggle with understanding that this life is not meant for the things you can gather, the things you can get, the things you can buy, the things you can have. It, it has nothing to do, it bears no weight. The same kind of amazing regalia that the high priest was dressed in, those two sons were dressed in that same kind of regalia, came before the Lord and offered a terrible sacrifice before him, offered a profane offering before him, and God killed them. And we as Christians want to come and do a similar thing because we're being jammed up by the, the messaging of the world. We're being confused and jammed up by success and things and having and having and having. I'm not saying you shouldn't want to feed yourself. I'm not saying you shouldn't want, I'm not saying you must go out there and make decisions that are now irresponsible in terms of your stewardship and your looking after your family and looking after yourself and having things. What I am saying is your relationship to wanting those things must be in check. Because the ultimate priority, the ultimate priority for you and me, like it or not now, once you said yes to Christ, and thank goodness you did. The ultimate priority is linked to that of Christ. So that must be mine too. So when I said yes, it must be mine too. Many are the plans of a man's heart, but the Lord directs his steps. Which means I may have the plans, but man, my goodness, God has an idea and a plan above what I think. And I've got to submit to that. And I've got to follow that because my plans are not his plans. 
not 100% they're not his plans. Unless your plans are, Lord, I absolutely want to live with, with, for you, absolutely want you to use me, how, whichever way you do. Lord, send me on the next mission. Even then, you have to check your heart because sometimes you can swing the opposite way. Some of us may, may be locked in with our materialism. Some of us may be locked in with our idolatry of Christendom. We make our Christianity, the fact that we are now holy, we make that an idol. And God says, no, that's not, even, that's not, that's not, what, I'm, that's not what I'm about. I'm not asking you to do this, this, and this because of your own will. I'm asking you to follow me and my promptings. It's very clear when Scripture says, if, if you are called as something, you must go ahead and be that thing. Do that. Do not just throw yourself into things, which is what um, Nadab and Abihu did. They threw themselves into a position that was not meant for them. They were not called for that moment. They were not called for that situation. You can get hurt being super spiritual as well as getting hurt being lukewarm. Do you get where I'm at? The point of everything is about the heart of God reconciling His holiness to His people who do not bear His image anymore. That's the point of all of it. I want to ask you to go and do some business. I'm going to wrap it up here with a prayer. But if any of you feel as though there is, um, excuse me. If anyone tonight <clears throat> needs prayer, please come. Let's pray. God wants to give you and I, each and every one of us, a heart that is ready, ready, ready for what he wants, when he wants it, how he wants it. God wants you to possess within you the heart he has for those you engage with and walk across the street with, um, at work with, all of it. He wants you to have that heart every day. Freely you receive now, freely give. And, and I, if I was to ask you, when you heard that verse, be honest with me, the first thing, was that about money? Was that about you thinking about giving money? Was that about you thinking about giving stuff? This is what I'm talking about when we, when we look at ourselves as Christians today, how much we are jammed up by material influence. Our society is full in our, in our, in our minds, in our thinking. We think, when we read scripture, we think about it through the lens of the world. And God wants to renew that tonight. Because what you received was the free gift of God, the gift of, of, of an of a, of a identity again, a holiness again, a space of getting into the presence and intimate presence, presence of the Father. That's what you freely received. That is what you must freely give. Through Jesus Christ himself, that's what you must give. God appreciates you giving to the poor. I, I don't want you to, to get me get it twisted here. But I want to remind you how, how Peter, it was Peter, says to the man who is out in the streets, silver and gold I have none, but what I do have, I give to you. So his first response is absolutely, it's proof that he understands what the heart of the Father is. It is not to give someone just blindly. And I use that also with respect. Because I'm not saying that your arms are not doing work. Yes, they are. Please continue giving people. Give, help people. But if that is where you think your life as a Christian is ticking the box, if that is where you think that is the priority of what you are, me what you are meant to do when it says freely you have received, now freely give, I'm going to say to you respectfully, you're missing the point. So tonight, I want to pray for you tonight. I want to pray for you. If part of your life 
when you're reading scripture, part of your eyes, what you always see and how you correlate to the verses have got to do with an external giving of stuff and not actually a, a, a heart brokenness for those who are lost. That's what I want to pray for. Because I want you to have what God wants you to have and that is for you to be in love and passionate about the work that he wants for us to do. Which is to go out into the harvest field and for us to go and, and get people saved. Not that we save them, Jesus saves them, but we need to go and preach the gospel. How can people be saved if they've not heard? Scripture says. Let's pray. Father God, I want to thank you, Lord. I want to thank you, God, that your heart for each and every person on this planet is for them to know you. I want to thank you, God, that you love, you love us so much that you would place your son, you would place him on a cross, you would make him the scapegoat for the world, you would, you would have him stripped bare, you would have him come before you in all humility, you would have him be the perfect sacrificial offering, you would have him be the perfect ceremonial and civil offering, you would have him fulfill all law and see the torment, the hurt, the, the, the abuse, see him be just broken. Your son, Jesus, the son of God, be reduced to blood, be reduced to mockery, to be spat on, spit on, all of the all of the, the, the onslaught of, of man's hate and anger to be pushed his way. And still in that moment, for you, Lord Jesus, to say, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. For that grace and that love to be extended. That you would show in your full, full scope of the story the story we read sometimes with <clears throat> half a heart, a full heart, um, focused, not focused, however we ingest it, Father, that we, when we read it, even we, we wouldn't even be excited about reading anything from the Old Testament. And yet you would lay on our hearts tonight the extent to which the Israelites would have to go through their own living existence, lived existence in your presence. And all of that, God, you would spare us. You would spare us because of your son. You would see a better sacrifice, much better sacrifice through your son. And then you would commission us, God. You would say to us, go out into all the world and preach the gospel in the name of Jesus. Go, 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 preach it. You would say to us, I am with you. I am with you. I am with you. I am with you now because you are mine. I am holy and now you are holy now. I am holy and now you are holy now. You are with me. We are, we are able to be in, in, this, in the same room together now. We are able to be in the, in the same space. I don't, I don't actually have you outside of my space anymore, outside of my presence. I haven't kicked you out anymore. I've brought you back. I've brought you back into my presence. See what I've done. I want you to do the same for everyone else. Those you meet, those I put on your heart, I want you to do the same. God, I want to thank you for all of that. I want to thank you, God, that that is, that is part of what you've done and that I, as you speak and sit with us tonight, that you would say to us, I want you to, to unlock yourselves from the world. I want you to unlock yourselves from how the world thinks and I want you to grab onto what I'm doing. I want you to grab onto what I have and I want you to be active in your, in your life with me. No more sitting on the sidelines. No more just waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. I want you to connect with me. 
and I want us to go. I want us to move. My heart for this world is for us to go and be on that rescue mission together. There's still work to be done. If anyone tonight is being prompted by the king to number one, really come to terms with answering that call and going on that mission with God and making that decision, if the Lord is speaking to you tonight, please do not leave until we've prayed together. Secondly, if every time you read scripture and every just just in your in your own reading and and how you how you digest scripture and, and, and every promise that comes, every blessing that is spoken about, if the way in which you see that is that it's about material gain and and having a wonderful life and and having a, a, a acquiring things, if that is how you see scripture, come. Let us pray with you. Let's pray together. Let's ask for God to renew our hearts and minds so that we can see scripture for what it is meant for, the actual rescue mission of those who do not yet know him. Holiness to be returned and restored to those who bear the image of a holy God. And that is only through people confessing and getting to grips with the truth and the life-giving, life-giving sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. If you have any of those two things that you said yes to, please do not leave and let's pray. Let's pray with you tonight. I'm going to pray for us as we just dismiss the service, but I want to ask you to please hold, hold back. Don't go. We'll, uh, we'll have tea and coffee out in the, in the lobby. Um, please get together with some people and, and speak and share some, some tea with us. I want to thank you for being here tonight. I really believe that the, the word shared tonight is meant to encourage you, not just to knock you down. It is not meant to knock you down. It's meant to encourage you, to, to really get you to grips with the heart of the Father. There's so much God has planned for us but we miss it because we think of it through a material, societal, modern lens. And God says, that's not how I work. So God, I want to thank you for each and every person here tonight. I want to ask that you will be with them, Father, as they go into the week. I want to thank you, Father, for their challenges, each and everything that they might be going through, Father God, that you would give wisdom in how they should navigate it, that you'd give them such incredible tips and and, and, and a helping hand, Lord, that you would come and comfort for those who are hurting, that you would come and be a, 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 a support and a help for those who, who need it, God. I want to thank you, God, for your love for us tonight, that we could feel your absolute call and your absolute love enveloping us tonight. I want to thank you for your peace, Jesus, that goes with us. I want to thank you, God, for hearts that are ready and and tongues that are ready to speak life into others and share the gospel of truth. I pray, Father God, for your, for your anointing on each and every person, that they will go out into this world, our oh, Father, knowing that you have gone ahead. We experienced that tonight, even before Adam and Eve sinned. You were ahead of them with the rescue plan. And so we know that even before we wake up tomorrow morning, you will have already put things in motion for us. Open our eyes to see. Open our eyes to find you in our day today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all. Thank you all, church. Please do not leave if um, you need prayer. We're here to pray, so let's pray. Let's do business. I, I really want to thank you for your time. Um, I, I spoke too much, man. <laughs> but thank you, God. Thank you, God. God is faithful. It's something I'm very passionate about. So um, if, if you want to just talk, let's talk.